Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, there are varying estimates of how the sequester will affect agriculture. Monsanto's case against an Indiana farmer is heard before the U.S. Supreme Court. In Southern Gardening, the cyclamen. This cool weather bloomer appears delicate, but it's tougher than it looks. In the markets, a big spike higher for cotton this week, as the number of cattle placed in feedlots increases compared to a year ago. In the feature segment, it is unfortunately a familiar situation. Farmers having to give up land to pipelines, highways, and in this case, a high-speed rail line proposed in California. It will run through the Central Valley, also known as America's Salad Bowl. So the league said, you know what, we're going to fight this thing. And the reason for fighting it as well is we have a couple of our members, Japanese Americans, they're going to lose their grandparents' home they're up in arms because this high-speed rail is just going to tear through their home that they were born in. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. You've heard a lot about the sequester. It could affect food inspections, which could hurt the livestock industry. Leighton, some have accused President Obama of hyping the worst case scenario involving sequester cuts. The Office of Management and Budget said food inspections could be hit. The OMB said the U.S. Food and Drug Administration could conduct 2,100 fewer inspections and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Food Safety and Inspection Service could have to furlough all employees for approximately two weeks to meet the across-the-board budget cuts. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack said that it could be weeks or months before meat packing plants might have to close due to a furlough of meat inspectors. Vilsack says there are several employee union agreements which do require advance notice of furloughs up to 120 days. Scott George, president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, said on February 14th that Vilsack's decision to announce the furlough threat had already cost cattle producers significant amounts of money with the downward slide in the futures markets caused by rampant speculation. Now, if the USDA's report schedule is offered, Reuters says this would affect some livestock marketing contracts since they are based on USDA reports. For example, the daily calculation of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange's feeder cattle index and lean hog index are based on USDA reports. Last week, a case involving Monsanto and an Indiana soybean farmer was argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. The farmer says Monsanto has bullied farmers with its patents and lost his case previously against Monsanto. It involves Roundup Ready soybeans. U.S. Supreme Court justices were poised to uphold lower court rulings that favored agribusiness giant Monsanto in a case involving its patented Roundup Ready soybean seeds. Indiana farmer Vernon Hugh Bowman was a regular customer of Monsanto, whose licensing agreements prohibit saving or reusing seeds once the original crops have grown. By law, new seeds must be purchased annually. In 1999, Bowman bought leftover product from a local grain elevator, which sells the seeds for ancillary use, such as animal feed and milling. Instead, Bowman used the less expensive variety for perilous late-season planting. Successful in his gamble, the farmer continued the questionable practice for eight years. But in 2007, Monsanto sued Bowman and won more than $80,000 in damages. The issue for the high court now is to determine how far the patents extend. And Bowman believes that cheaper seeds he acquired from the elevator are no longer covered by Monsanto's patents. I didn't look at it as a loophole because I'd always been able to go to the elevator and buy the seed, you follow me? So uh, I just looked at it that when they dumped it in there that they had abandoned their patent. They, you know, why wouldn't they have... Uh, want it to be kept separate. If, if they want to protect their patent, then it looks to me like it would be required, they'd have, be required to have to separate it at the elevator and keep it separate. 
Bowman argues that Monsanto uses its clout as the world's largest seed producer to bully small farmers into compliance. Monsanto, on the other hand, claims it spent 13 years and hundreds of millions of dollars developing the seed, which was first introduced in 1996. And while Supreme Court justices appeared likely to side with Monsanto, the case isn't exactly a slam dunk. Under patent law, uh, if a patent holder authorizes the sale of a patented article or invention, uh, after that first sale, the patent holder's rights in that invention or article or product are what we call exhausted, and the purchaser can do whatever he wants with it. In arguments at the high court, none of the justices seemed ready to endorse Bowman's arguments that the cheap soybeans he bought at a grain elevator were not covered by the Monsanto patents. Justice Stephen Breyer said Bowman could make many uses of the soybeans he bought from the grain elevator. Feed it to the animals, feed it to your family, or make tofu turkey. But Breyer maintained patent law makes it illegal for Bowman to plant them. What it prohibits here, he said, is making a copy of the patented invention, and that is what he did. The high court is expected to rule on the case by June. Well, if you've been looking for a new plant to brighten the winter months, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, a stitch and horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman will show us the colorful cyclamen will certainly take care of your winter blues. Cyclamen is a fantastic indoor plant for the winter season. It has a long bloom period and produces loads of colorful flowers. Cyclamen is certainly a colorful plant. There is a wide variety of flower colors ranging from soft pastels of pink, white, and purple. The flower buds nod on straight, tall stems above the foliage. Once the petals open, they are swept back. Having varying patterns of silver and gray, the heart-shaped leaves are a highly attractive feature of cyclamen. This plant likes lots of bright indirect light and keep the plant containers away from heating ducts. Low humidity can be a problem growing cyclamen indoors during the winter months. Place the cyclamen container on a layer of pebbles in a tray filled with water. Cyclamen like temperatures that are in the 40 to 60 degree range and for much of the winter the plants can be outdoors. During colder weather, move the cyclamen containers inside they are quite at home enjoying and brightening the interior. Watering is the biggest problem for the home gardener with cyclamen. Overwatering is to be avoided. Always wait for the potting mix to feel dry to the touch and water thoroughly around the outside of the container. Never water directly on the crown as this can encourage crown rot. Place in the sink to allow the container to drain completely. When choosing a cyclamen to take home from the garden center, make sure the flower stems are straight and there's lots of little flower buds underneath the foliage. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Leighton the cyclamen is a member of the primrose family and it comes originally from the area around the Mediterranean Sea. Hmm. Well, in the feature segment today, see why some farmers in California's Central Valley are fighting that state's proposed high-speed railroad service. And before we get to the markets with Leighton today, we've got, as of our taping on Thursday, cold weather headed into Mississippi, going to be in the 20s. Uh, I'm sure if somebody has some early corn out in South Mississippi, it's going to bite it back for right. sure. But uh, coldest weather of the winter right here when it's starting to warm, really warm up. Right. I got my sweater. I'm ready. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Not me, man. I can take it. Well, Leighton, uh, you say we start this month and there's an uptrend in the cotton market. A big upward move, in fact, on Wednesday ahead of the February 28th export sales report. Also in the markets this week, the corn trade faces uncertain conditions for the upcoming new crop. Wheat sees some increasing feed demand as more cattle are placed in the nation's feedlots in the month of January. March cotton settled at its highest level in two weeks at the close on Wednesday. The wire services say the spike in the futures came as traders were positioning themselves ahead of the February 28th weekly export sales report. That Thursday report was expected to reveal some big export sales numbers for cotton. The Doan Cotton Commentary reports that December futures had been looking somewhat toppy until that spike, but now Doan says the uptrend in cotton appears very healthy. Well, many analysts are apparently feeling the U.S. corn crop for 2013 is 
somewhat of an uncertainty at the moment. Sure, they know the planted acreage is likely and going to be huge, but the questions come when you talk about the condition of the soil the corn is going into in some parts of the country. Trader John Roach explains. I mean, what we have is a, a, a lot of acres that are going to be planted, and, and half of the corn acreage is, is going to have very dry subsoil conditions. And now we could recharge some subsoil and we could, we could get into a better position, but at the moment we're going to need to have very timely rains all the way through the growing season for at least half of the Corn Belt, at least the part of the Corn Belt that's west of the Mississippi, and even some to the east. So the, there's, it's, a, it's a real dicey situation as far as yields are concerned, but we know acres are going to be very large. In the wheat sector, analyst Virgil Robinson says it appears more feed demand is surfacing. He attributes that to the fact that the price of wheat and the price of corn are fairly close as we transition from February to March. Soft red um, wheat, the value of it has declined and aligned itself again with corn value, or pretty darn close in select areas. So I think it's the recipient of some feed demand and the department acknowledged that in February, increasing wheat for feed. And as long as those two price levels remain fairly close, I think wheat will be in demand as far as feed is concerned. Our trivia quiz this week deals with growing interest in marketing pine straw in Mississippi. And here's the question for you. Which type of pine straw commands a higher market price? Is the answer A, longleaf, B, loblolly, or C, slash? You'll find out in a few more minutes. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the second part of the markets. Layton Span reports times were good for John Deere equipment, while the cattle on feed report shows increased placements. In the feature segment today, why are farmers so in favor of protecting private property rights? We'll just ask the growers who are about to lose land to a high-speed rail line. Committed? Absolutely. People rely on me. I don't take that lightly. Sure, sometimes we get out of sync and things feel forced. That's when the commitment kicks in. You buckle down, hammer it out, and keep it together for everybody involved. So, yeah, I'm completely committed to my marriage. Till death do us part. Commit to your marriage. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the farm week calendar. The Crosby Arboretum at Picayune, Mississippi is holding its annual spring plant sale in three weeks. It takes place Friday and Saturday, March 22nd and 23rd. The hours are 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. both days. If you're an Arboretum member, you get in an hour early and make your picks. Now, you will be able to find hard-to-find native plants at this sale. There will also be experts on hand to give you advice on how to get your plant started right. Two beef cattle boot camps will happen in April. They're sponsored by the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Mississippi Agriculture and Forestry Experiment Station. You'll learn about hoof care, crossbreeding systems, forage, feed, and mineral nutrition. Register early and the fee is $35. At the door, $45. On Friday, April 12th, the boot camp takes place at the South Farm on campus at Mississippi State University in Starkville. The following Friday, it moves to the MSU Brown Loam Experiment Station. That's on Seven Springs Road at Raymond. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. If new tractor manufacturing and sales by one company are any indication, the ag economy in the United States is still strong. An Iowa newspaper reports that John Deere has added almost 1,500 union wage workers to the payroll at its huge Waterloo, Iowa facility in the last three and a half years. Now the total employment there at the plant where many of Deere's large tractors are made is now roughly 6,000 people that the newspaper says is the highest number of workers there in 20 years. The monthly cattle on feed report was released since our last Farm Week production. One aspect of that document may signal the end of what has been a trend for several months. Extension Ag economist Brian Williams talked about the numbers late Thursday morning. 
Brian, did this latest cattle on feed report vary significantly from previous months? We saw a few small changes from last month. Uh, one change was there was a 1% decrease in the total cattle on feed compared to last month. Uh, there was a 13% increase in our placements compared to last month and then a 10% increase in the fed cattle marketing compared to last month. But I think a lot of that is can be contributed to the uh, seasonal changes rather than market. Well, kind of bringing this down to the farm gate, are we producing more cattle right now than the market can really support? In short term, yes, but in long term, no. And, and there's a lot of reasons behind that that particularly don't have to do with the cattle market itself or the cattle production itself. We saw some hits in demand that were kind of unexpected with, with a snowstorm on the East Coast, with the flu outbreak, and with the payroll tax that kind of hit the, just kept hitting the demand for that. So in the short term, it, it's hit it, but I think that we'll kind of come out of that in the next few months. But for right now, it's, it's kind of tough if you're in the feedlot business. I mean, they're, they're basically losing money as each head leaves, right? It is. They're, they're taking hits from both sides. On the cattle coming in, the, the prices of the feeder cattle are still strong fundamentally with the, the short supply. And then on the other side coming out uh, with these recent decreases in, in the demand, temporary decreases in the demand, that's hit the fed cattle prices a little bit. Plus the corn prices have been staying somewhat strong too. So they're just getting hit from all directions. So as far as fat cattle, are, are we near a bottom maybe as far as prices in, in that arena? I think we're getting close to a bottom. Uh, we have saw, saw prices come up a little bit over the last week and, and the fundamentals are there. And, and I think as we get into spring and summer, as, as people start firing up the grills and getting out, you know, shoveling out of the snow and stuff, we'll see the demand pick up a little bit and help out the prices on that side. And on the feeder side, briefly, what's the price picture? Stronger right now than fed, but down right, the road, right. what do you think? I think we're still going to be strong. And, and even though I've been saying this as prices have been going down, I think that the fundamentals are there in the feeder cattle market, particularly just because of the supply issues and, and the, the total herd size is, is decreasing. And I think that's really going to keep strong fundamentals in the, in the markets. Before this week's feature story, our trivia answer is next. And that answer this week is A, longleaf pine straw typically commands a higher market price, according to a new publication from the Extension Service. Well, as part of his stimulus package of 2009, President Obama included an $8 billion check to build high-speed railroads. Now, up to $3.5 billion could go to California, which is about to begin an ambitious project linking San Francisco and Los Angeles. Construction is set to begin soon in California's Central Valley, an area known as America's Salad Bowl. Market to Market's David Miller says the project could be the end of the line for some farmers. The idea of riding a train at speeds of more than 200 miles per hour has long been the dream of many around the world. While common in Europe, Japan, and China, the idea has been slow to take root closer to home. Several states have attempted to spark regular high-speed rail service, but the likely contender to be first is California. Tom Richards is vice chairman of the California High-Speed Rail Authority Board. When you think about what the alternatives are in California, the surface transportation system, the highway system in California was designed years and years ago, decades ago, for a population that was somewhat less than 20 million people. A new uh, assessment of current population growth that just came out earlier this week or last week, uh, which reduces what the anticipated population is by mid-century, but it's still uh, estimated at 50 million people. When completed, the 800 miles of track will comprise the largest transportation infrastructure investment in state history. Traveling at speeds of up to 220 miles per hour, passengers will travel from San Francisco to Los Angeles in just over two and a half hours, nearly 40% faster than by automobile. While official high-speed rail authority figures show the project costing $68.4 billion, other estimates approach $100 billion. But even before funding was approved by California voters in 2008, 
Many voices join together against the plan. There's no need at this time for this type of, of train. There will be maybe in the future, but right now look at us. The concern with high-speed rail is a lack of a stable financial plan. We are mostly um, scared that there, the process has not been followed. Manuel Cunha is president of the Nisei Farmers League, a San Joaquin Valley-based farmer advocacy group with 1,100 members. So the league said, you know what, we're going to fight this thing. And the reason for fighting it as well is we have a couple of our members, Japanese Americans, they're going to lose their grandparents' home. They're up in arms because this high-speed rail is just going to tear through their home that they were born in. The initial phase of construction is slated to take place in the Central Valley of California between Merced and Fresno. Despite objections by most of the county governments in the area, Democratic Governor Jerry Brown signed a bill in mid-July last year allowing the California legislature to authorize the sale of $2.7 billion worth of construction bonds. The money will be matched by $3.3 billion in federal funds, allowing for the first 130-mile section of track to be laid. The steel rails will cut through a portion of the valley's 6 million acres of cropland, which produces a good share of the nation's winter fruits and vegetables. The original plan was to create an independent path connecting the major urban centers of California. But in order to reduce the price tag by nearly $30 billion, a new route was created combining dedicated roadbed and existing right-of-way. The California High-Speed Rail Authority estimates 320 billion fewer vehicle miles will be traveled over the 40 years following completion of the project in 2028. Officials with the Golden State's Rail Board predict 12 billion fewer pounds of greenhouse gases will be produced and 237 million gallons of auto fuel will be saved annually. Nearly 120 million people are expected to take advantage of the faster service by 2030. The High Speed Rail Authority says at least 600,000 construction jobs and 450,000 permanent jobs will have been created when the entire route is completed in 15 years. Officials also say it will help revitalize communities along the line, but Cunha believes the project will be devastating to local farmers. So the jobs in my industry are going to be huge to loss, and they're saying, well, we're going to put those people to work. No, you're not. Don't, don't fool me, because you're talking about people operating uh, major big equipments, which is tied to the unions and tied to other issues, and those aren't going to be those jobs that are around here. They're going to come from other states that have economic problems. And they could even come from those countries that we're going to buy the steel from or the train from. We don't make the trains around here, and we don't make any steel around here. So all of these together are going to be um, controlled by a um, very small group of people. But we're going to lose all the jobs that we have here. Thousands of acres of private property will have to be purchased or acquired in order to complete the massive transportation project. The state of California will need 4,500 acres alone to finish the Central Valley line. I may have to ask two neighbors to the west of me if I could go through their land to go farm my other piece of ground, whereas before, I farmed it all in one spot. We have to mitigate those, those implications or impacts. Part of what we believe works is the same thing that's worked in Europe. And what's worked in Europe is where you have land swaps. So you may have a farmer that's being impacted over here, and we understand that. But there is an opportunity, perhaps, to swap that piece of property that's been affected with the property owner to the, to the other side of that. Cunha and the Nisei Farmers League are opting not to take legal action, but others are. Three lawsuits have been filed by various groups to stop construction of the Central Valley project. Initial arguments are slated to begin in April. Last month, however, a Sacramento Superior Court judge denied a request to block work on the stretch between Merced and Fresno. Officials with the High Speed Rail Authority have stated they plan to seek common ground with each piece of litigation, but refuse to comment on any pending cases. Legal wrangling aside, the Central Valley project is proceeding at high speed. Bids have been accepted for a 30-mile section of track between Madeira and Fresno, 
and construction contracts are expected to be awarded in June. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. And you can watch this story again on the High Speed Railway on our Farm Week website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. You can also watch our stories on YouTube and Facebook. We'll also have a link to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well and read the script. That's farmweek.msucares.com. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our show next week, you're going to hear about ethanol, but it's not for cars. A distillery has sprung up to create alcohol from grains grown in Iowa. It's kind of a cross between the local food and microbrewery movements. In Southern Gardening, Laura Petalum, it grows best in full sun to partial shade. It was found originally in China. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.